3 and 4. And then we will be reading Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. John chapter 4, verses 3 and 4. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 19. Remember to keep Brother uh, Rodriguez and Brother uh, Mark Twig in your prayers um, as they are sick. Let's pray. Keep them in your prayers. Um, amen. John chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, and Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, and it reads like this. And John 4, 3 and 4, And he left Judea, Judea and departed again unto Galilee, and must needs go through Samaria. He must needs go through Samaria. Philippians chapter 4 verse 19 reads like this. But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ. Jesus. Today I want to preach or teach however this comes out. However the Holy Ghost moves this morning. I want to, when Jesus takes over. When Jesus takes over. You may be seated today. How many has ever been somewhere and you just see you just seeing things that's that's just being done wrong and you're like, man, I I if I was if I could just jump in and change it and run it a whole lot better. Right? We all think we're the saviors, right? Yeah, we all think we can streamline everything, you know. They're trying to reinvent wheels, and uh, I read on the news today that headlights are getting some kind of new infra infrastructure uh, redone. I didn't know there was a bill that needed to be passed to read overhaul headlights. You know what I mean? I don't know. It's just, but uh, we're, we always, you know, we always think that, you know, we see, we always look for the the bad and stuff, and you say, well, if I could do this differently, I was, if I was involved in that now begin to think about that how our minds constantly do that and we always have the easier better better way or my grandfather the gooder way uh, and I begin to think about that and then God took me and began to show me that's how he is with us when we are trying to run our lives without him involved in it. And God's sitting on the sidelines going, if they would just reach out to me, if they would just ask, if they would just seek me, if they would just, and we get so busy and caught up with our lives that we, we, we forget to ask. We say we do, we say we ask, we say, but in all, in all reality, uh, we, we ask in passing, we don't seek, we don't, worship God we don't beg for it we don't uh, we don't tarry that was one, one thing about the Quakers uh, and, I, and I'm not condoning their doctrine but the Quakers the old time Quakers uh, they would sit and literally for hours until the Holy Ghost moved that's why they called them Quakers uh, the, their, their preachers would fall out and lay on the pulpit for hours and the church would sit there and wait and then the preacher would get up and say what God had not, not condoning everything about the Quakers and you look at different times how the church progressed over the years and we've gotten to a point and I'm afraid that we, we're so we, we, and I believe we have the doctrine. I believe that we, we have this gospel. I love this gospel. But we're lacking something as an apostolic church in this hour, and that is knowing and learning how to uh, tarry again, how to wait upon God. Um, I was listening to a lesson the other day, and it was a, and a, and a preacher was 
uh, talking about his pastor had invited him to come pray with him at the church. And he was just so excited about going down to the church to pray. And they got there at 8 o'clock in the morning. And they were going strong. 9 o'clock rolled around. 11 o'clock rolled around. That man's pastor was still praying, going strong. 1 o'clock rolled around. 4 o'clock rolled around. The pastor was not missing a beat. 5 o'clock rolled around. All of a sudden, that man's pastor, they had got up, they had started at 8 o'clock in the morning. And the pastor got up and said, oh my, I didn't mean to keep you down here this long. I better hurry home. My wife's making dinner for me. This other preacher began to talk about prayer. And he said, old time churches, uh, it was at least an hour of prayer before church. Now it got down to half hour before church. And now a half hour of prayer is almost too long for somebody to pray. I don't know how how much I'm going to get through the lesson here today. But I want to talk about some things that we need to allow God to redefine in our lives and our walk with God. It's not based upon how we feel. Yesterday, I didn't feel like working, but it wasn't, it, it, there's never a point where I don't feel like praying. And I came down here with a mindset that God, however long, I just want to hear from you. That's why the Bible says body, body, bodily exercise profiteth, it profiteth some, but the Bible calls it little. Here in scripture, I just read two passages of scripture and, and uh, where it says he must needs go through Samaria. And then Philippians 4.19 is the one that we like to quote about how he will supply all of our need, your need. One word, two different meanings. In John 4.4, 4, needs means something that is necessary that must be done Jesus saw it was necessary it was a need it it was necessary to go through Samaria Philippians 419 is something we it refers to something that we are lacking in and many only pray until their needs are met not until their will is changed. I know this is a different message this morning. A lot lot of us, our prayer lives evolve around Philippians 4.19. The Lord gave me this the other day, and I'm just going to try my best to follow the Holy Ghost. We, We build our prayer lives around Philippians chapter 4, verse 19. Because we always feel we're lacking in something. Now that's that's not scriptural. If you have the Holy Ghost this morning, the Bible says that you are complete. Right? If if we're going to say we're Bible-believing Christians, then why, if we are spirit-filled, always feeling that we are lacking in and always praying for God to give us something or supply something because we feel we're always lacking in something. I'm talking about maturity and growing, and there's really no visitors today. I count all y'all as family. Come on now. Amen. But our, our prayer lives are built around praying for things that we believe we're lacking in, and really God wants us to have a greater understanding of who He is. And that when we're filled with His Spirit, I was praying yesterday, and 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 I said, God, take me back to, because the greatest point in my life, we always say that we're supposed to get, 
get the Holy Ghost and everything just gets greater and greater. No. When you get the Holy Ghost, you're already complete. That's your high point in your walk with God. God wants you to be constant. God's essence doesn't get greater and greater and greater. He's already great. He's always been great. And many times we, we fail because our, our prayer lives is, is built, built around Philippians chapter 4, 4, verse 19. And we never allow our spiritual walk to grow and mature. In John chapter 4, verse 4, we never pray until our will is changed till we say, God, I want to do something for somebody else. God, I want to be able to go and reach somebody else. I must needs go. God, this I want to, you to tell me to do something that is necessary to do that will benefit somebody else. Many pray till their needs are met and not until their will not until their will is changed. And many only desire to follow follow Jesus for the fishes and the loaves. There's many crowds when the fishes and loaves were going on, but when Jesus started teaching and the bread basket wasn't being passed around, come on, somebody. That's kind of how it is in, in church today, man. When it's potluck Sunday, man, we have a house full. Right? Luke chapter 22, verse 39 says, And he came out and went, and as he went to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. This is Luke chapter 22, verse 39, verse 40. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, Pray that ye enter not into temptation. Jesus commanded his disciples to pray. Now, I'm, I'm preaching some, teaching something that is going to be very controversial to your flesh today. Jesus commanded his disciples to pray. I'm going to say it again. We are commanded to pray. That if they did not pray, right, they would in turn enter, in temp, enter into temptation. And this morning as I was sitting down at my, at my desk and praying over this message uh, that God had given me and God put in my spirit, too many are comfortable, too many are too comfortable entering into temptation instead of entering into prayer. Now, oftentimes, because why? Uh, it, it, what, what makes the flesh feel good is what we we just we we, we tunnel vision after, and we just f follow after. Why? Because uh, th uh, that's why pornography. See, per pornography, and we say, well, it's only in men. Men and women's involved in that. It satisfies the flesh. But when and we're so easily. Uh, 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 more, more comfortable to enter into, into temptation than if we just begin to pray and enter into a time of prayer and consecration and separation and then finding a prayer closet somewhere and say, God, lead me not into temptation. Christianity has been focused upon love and grace. One preacher said it like this, if you want to stop revival in, in your church, only preach about the love of God. Not about what we have to do. Faith without works is dead. Amen? And as Christians, God does not uh, uh, endorse uh, 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 people that, uh, or, or His children that want to just... Uh, just comfortably enter in temptation every single day. The Bible says that sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Verse number 41, And when he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, Amen, Jesus is telling us there has to be, there must be a place where you pray, Amen, with one another, and then there must be a place where you can pray alone with God. Prayer is essential in this last hour. I'm not talking about 
a, me, a, a, a methodical prayer. That's uh, the Methodist. That they're, they, uh, they're methods. There's all about methods. That's why we have to get out. Method, 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 method. Methods don't save us. It's seeking that save us. It's having a heart that can hear the voice of God. A heart that can long after the, come on, uh, amen, a spirit that can interact with his, amen. It's not about a method about how long you pray or how, how uh, big 26 letter words you put in your prayer, amen. Or go back to the verbiage of the King James Version Bible, amen. We have to understand that God, amen, is in habits of praises of his people. Amen. When we begin to worship him and we begin to praise him, God desires that God inhabits that and God can move move in a place where people know how to get a hold of him he went on to say father if thou be willing remove this cup from me nevertheless not my will but thine be done and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were great drops of blood falling to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping for sorrow. The Lord began to move upon me about this particular passage of Scripture. Amen. And he said here in verse 42, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Whatever happened to praying until the Spirit of God took over. Y'all busy. Y'all got an agenda. Y'all got things to do. People to see, horses to sell, right? Pentecost was birthed out of people that knew how to tarry until God moved. Pentecost was birthed, amen, when a group of people got together and said, God, we're just going to wait on the promise, the promise that you have given us, amen. And we look at this, and so many times in our prayer life, if we only pray until we get our Philippians 4.19 out, that God's going to supply all my needs, and then, whoo, God, I feel refreshed. God's going to pay the house bill this month. You better watch out. You may not have that house next month. Can I tell you this? If you're constantly in prayer over your house or your car, who are you worshiping? Ooh, I'll leave that one alone. And it says, And there an angel appeared unto him from heaven, strengthening him. And many of us pray until this point. We pray until we get strengthened. And then we say, God, whoo, man, that was great. I had a come to Jesus meeting. And we pray till we're strengthened. Right? Well, prayer isn't, I'm going to tell you this, prayer is not pretty. True apostolic prayer is not pretty. When you're worried about if the button's buttoned on your suit coat and if the preacher lays hand on, hands on you and messes your hair do up. Come on, somebody. Amen. And yet prayer is not pretty. My Bible tells me that Jesus prayed his, in his humanity. He said, God, I don't want, and it, it was his dual, dual his humanity and spirit. As man, he was praying, God, amen, I don't want my will to be done, but God, I want your spirit to be done. Amen. And the Bible says an angel came down and strengthened him, and he could have stopped there. He said, God, you've given me the strength to go out to Calvary. Amen. I'm here to remind somebody, don't stop praying to after God begins to strengthen you your spirit Woo! God was great man that was a great service I did 40 laps God healed my body
Have you ever thought God may have healed your body so that you could continue in prayer? Have you ever thought God may have answered your prayer about your house so that you could continue on in prayer? If there's so many times we pray until we are strengthened and then we say, God, that's all you're about is Philippians chapter 4 verse 19. But our prayer life has to have more depth. That's why, that's why stuff is stuff. I'm going to be honest with you. I lose my house tomorrow, so be it. God's going to give me another house. My boss one time to try to get me to work overtime and miss church. I looked at him and said, nope. God gave me this job, he'll give me another one. Right? My God supplies my needs. And we, 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 we pray until we're strengthened. We pray until uh, we feel good about our situation. But we never allow ourselves to continue on. In verse 44 it says, And, and being in an agony. Oh, I just can't get to that prayer. I can't get to that place with God. I challenge you this morning. There's a place that God is asking you to be. There's a place that God is asking you to get to. And it's only going to be done uh, uh, by applying yourself. Amen. And, 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 and being able to take the time and say, God, not my will, but thy will be done. God, I'm going to pray. God, you're going to strengthen me. And I'm going to keep on praying. The Bible says in his sweat was that were great drops of blood falling down to the, to the ground. As a little boy, I remember, distinctly remember my grandfather praying out in the building out behind the house. He didn't pray for 10 minutes, 15 minutes through our little professional Pentecost prayer. Whew, I have a great prayer life. I was at the church 15 minutes. Spent 10, spent 10 minutes on Facebook while I was there, but I, I was at the church for 15 minutes. I got things to do. I got places to be. And God is calling for his church to get to a place with him. Have you ever thought that if your loved ones saw something different in you, that might change their minds about living for God? Think about it. Jesus said, who is my mother? Who is my father? Who is my brother? Who, you, you go down the list. He was ready to isolate himself away and say, I want to fulfill the purpose in my life, not just my needs, not just strengthen me. And see, when you begin to pray about God's will in your life, Jesus never asked for God to strengthen him. He was concerned about what he was about to do, about to go to Calvary. He wasn't concerned about all the other things that we pray about and mindlessly fill 25 minutes up with God, help me hit the lottery. God, get, make me the best uh, supervisor on my job. I want to rise up in the company. This world needs to see Jesus. Not us. If we are truly hid, come on, hid in Christ. Hid. And it says, when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping. Get this. <laughs> they hadn't even prayed. What were they sorry about? Sleeping for poor little me. I got to be at the church. Poor little me. I got to pray. He asked me to pray. What are we doing out in this garden? Don't you know what time it is? Did he download the weather app on his phone? It's not pretty out here. I don't know what the weather was like then, but 
Obviously, they were sad about something. And our prayer life is often dictated about what's around us and what's going on. And we find more pleasure in sorrow than we do in being in time with, with God. Now, I know this is not my cookie-cut message for, and I don't have cookie-cut messages, but this is not my normal message for a Sunday. But God is desiring His people to get back to where we need to be. And I came here not to condemn, not to put press, past condemnation on anybody, but to challenge us. To allow our prayer lives to elevate Jesus in our life, not our needs. Come on. Elevate Jesus in our lives, not our wants, not our desires. Elevate Jesus in our life. Amen. He must increase. We must decrease. A, 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 prayer, a true prayer life, a true consecrated life with God will always increase God in your life. And it will decrease yourself. People say, what is prayer? How should I pray? Is it really necessary? My psychiatrist said I, didn't, I have to spend more time. We have, more, we have no issue sitting in a psychiatrist wherever. I've never been in one. Their lounge chair with their coffee or whatever they have. And we have no problem sitting an hour in their chair. But an, altar, an hour at the altar, it don't make sense. An hour in the doctor's office. I had an appointment the other day at 9.30. I didn't get in at almost 11. I wonder if the guy had a watch on his wrist. Right? We have no problem sitting in an hour or so at a, at a doctor's office or a psychiatrist's office. And we say, is it really necessary? And Jesus showed us by example that in our prayer life... We should pray until our will and the desire of our flesh is out of the way so that he, he can take over. As you can see, the problem of wanting to get back to Pentecost is normally church is out by 12. And if he ain't by 12, out by 12 well, I'll shake, away, I'll shake hands with him on Tuesday. I'll shake hands with him on Thursday. And if not, maybe I'll see him Sunday. And we complicate our walk with God, not because it's complicated, but we complicate our walk with God. God put this so strong in my, my spirit, and I almost put this on Facebook or about, please come out, God's gave me a definite word for today. But Jesus prayed until his flesh was submitted to the spirit. Amen. Where he could carry out his purpose. Not look what God blessed me with. Not look what I'm driving. Not look what I'm living in. Not look what I'm wearing. Not look what kind of job I have. Amen. But that we can pray until our flesh was out of the way. And we can say, God, not my will, but thy will. Praying until Jesus takes over. When your spirit begins to interact with his spirit. Amen. In that place where time and space does not exist. And you say, God, I didn't realize I've been praying for an hour or two. Amen. When's I asked the church on Thursday night. When's the last time in your prayer life? that people accuse you of being drunk the only way you can carry out your purpose for God is to pray until his spirit takes over if we do not pray until Jesus takes over then our life will be filled with doubt and confusion We'll say, why am, am I praying if things never happen? Why am I praying? This always comes out. I'm here to tell you, you're stopping, amen, before his spirit takes over with your spirit. You're stopping at Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, and never praying until God's purpose is filled in your life. His purpose can only be imparted into your life through his spirit. That's why we need a balance of the word and the spirit. You get some people that are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Right? You got some people, they can't even live for God, but they can see angels on the wall. I worry about those people. Amen? Can't even go to church, but I'm telling you what, they can walk on water if there was water in Barstow. Our 
Our prayer life has to be where God, we are saying, God, not my will, but thy will be done. And our life, when our God's will is being done in our life, then our life is filled with the power of God. You see, you say, well, God will never fill me with his spirit, amen, to, to, uh, to be persecuted. God, amen, it's always, it, it's always, it, it's always going to be ice cream and cakey cake. It's always going to be, amen, uh, uh, valley, uh, uh, meadows and, and, and butterflies. I'm here to tell you, amen, Jesus, amen, his humanity, he, he was God robed in flesh, but his flesh was filled with the spirit. Why? So that he could carry out Calvary so that you and I could be saved. God didn't fill you with the Holy Ghost to give you a good day. God filled you with his spirit so that you could fulfill his purpose. Not Philippians 4.19. That is going to come anyways. And oftentimes in our life, we, we, we pray and we say, God, what, what, why do I need, need to pray? And I, I'm here to tell you, if you don't, Get into the spirit of God. You will lose the awe and the wonder of God. Because you can only experience the awe and wonder of God if you're around God. Right? We have to pray until Jesus takes over. Otherwise, doubt and confusion will, will cloud our walk. And in a year or less, you will backslide. He said, why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And I, I begin to look at, 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 what have we done? What have we done to church? Not that it's talking about us, I'm talking about in North America in general. We've replaced study with prayer. Or we've, we've replaced a prayer with study. We brag about how much, how many hours we studied for the, what we were going to teach or preach. But we never mention how many minutes. It was hours behind the computer. Oh, I had six tabs open, Pastor. Woo! I was feeling it. I was one commentary to the next six tabs later, and I was, God was doing this, and God was. How much did you pray? about five minutes but then God gave me a thought I prayed about my situation but then it was only pastor I, it was only 30 seconds but then God just seemed to give me the answer and sometimes he does not but he doesn't always do that and we've replaced prayer with study we've, we've, we've changed worship practices to Let's get the chords right. Let's get the vocals right. Let's get this. We got. I believe in doing everything with excellence. But when's the last time the worship team prayed together? Oh, woo, pastor. Yeah. <laughs> Lord have mercy. We've replaced our physical needs with our, our prayer evolved around physical needs instead of our spiritual needs. The pursuit of this world instead of the pursuit of God. Amen. When there's no time for prayer, you're ne you'll never experience the power of God. You'll never experience the power of God if you don't pray. Amen. And I mentioned it early. God is making this world uncomfortable for Christians. We, we, we are praying for God to change people around us. But, amen, this, this world is not going to change. We're, cha we're praying for God to change lives, not this world. God, give us the right president. God puts kings in and takes kings out. That's in his word. The only way you're going to be looking for a second coming is if this world persecutes you. In your prayer life. Amen. I, I, I believe today that uh, 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 if, if we are comfortable in this world, we'll never be looking for the second return of Jesus Christ. And this is where I want to end today. And I, I, I this is, I mean, you just take this message how you want it. But God, this is where this message stemmed from. Genesis chapter 26, verse number 18 and 19. And Isaac, everybody 
pronounces it different. Isaac, Isaac. Digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham, his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found there was a well of spring of water. You know what our problem is today? We got a lot of problems, but a couple of them. We're renaming things instead of what it actually is. We're calling, I don't have a pastor anymore, I have a life coach. I go to a campus, not a church. Because we want to seem educated. The Bible says, Isaac digged again the waters of the wells and did not change their names. The Philistines had filled them up with dirt. The filth of this world. And we have too many wells today, and this is where I want to bring everything together today. Too many are gathered around a well that's filled with earth. You may say, what does that mean? Filled with earth, meaning that we are, we are covered, we are covering what is supposed to be there with our talents, our own objectives, and our own motives. Think about it. Our prayer life is all about our talents, our objectives, and our own motives. Isaac was at a point in his life where and, and he didn't get to use this well. He had to go on and dig another well. But I'm not preaching about that today. Isaac made sure that his family had a well. I hope that sticks with you today. Isaac made sure that his family had a well. You can't always be at church. Church is not open. I wish it was, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. But you're going to be at home sometime. You're going to be on your job. Your kids are going to be at school. Your family needs a well. A well, not where your objectives and your own motives flow, but where the, the Holy Ghost out of his belly shall flow wells of living water. There has to be a place, and man, where your family can draw from. There has to be a place where your family can find peace from. Isaac got to a point where he said, it does not matter where I'm at. Too many people say, well, I just can't make it in Barstow. And man, you don't have a relationship with God then, because it does not matter where you're at. You can dig a well and live for God. It don't matter what city you're in. You can dig a well and live for God it don't matter where your house is if I could just move my house out of the hood come on now it don't matter where you are if you dig a well you can survive if you want the water to begin to flow in your life you're going to have to clear you out of the way you well I was blaming everybody else American way. We, we, we're blaming China for everything now. China's going to own this country. Probably will. Probably already does. <laughs> but you have to dig until you not only see muddy water, you have to keep digging until the, wa the well well that no matter how many times you draw the bucket out it, it feels right back up to where it was come on somebody Amen. And when times get harder, I'm going to dig a little deeper. Amen. So that no matter how many times I put my bucket down into the well, and no matter how many hard times my family goes through, every time I go down, there's some water that I can draw out of. There's some life that I can draw from my family. There's, a, Amen. I don't have to worry about what this world is going to do to my family. I got a well in my house that I'm digging me out of the way. I'm, I'm, I'm getting rid of all distractions. I'm getting, I'm not talking about just sin, but I'm talking about distractions. Lay 
aside the ways we so easily beset us. Amen. Dig ourselves out of the way, our own uh, personal agendas and hobbies and motives and objectives and say, God, I'm going to dig a well at my home so that no matter what my family goes through, no matter where I'm at, Jesus can take over in my family. I'm talking about having a, a well. Not depending on our ability. I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. You have to dig, and I'm, I'm closing here. You have to dig until you realize that your life is more about what you, not, uh, your th that your life is more about not being focused on what you're lacking in but realizing in what you must do I just, that, that's why many people don't live for God because it's not convenient they never pray until living for God is necessary they never pray until praying is necessary. They never pray until reading your Bible is necessary. They never pray until being a witness for God. Come on. People say, well, how do you just keep living for God? Hey, man, I, I, there's a well in my life. That I don't, I, I don't trust in the ways of this world. I don't trust in man and medicines. And I don't trust in the riches of this world. But I do place my trust in God. And I do believe that he's the author and the finisher of my faith. And that tomorrow, even though it may come unexpected to my flesh. Amen. God already made a way. Amen. So that I can make it through tomorrow. I'm talking about a well. But it can only be dug by you. How many has ever dug a hole? Right? We built a fort one time. It was the coolest fort we ever built. It was so, it was so cool. The whole neighborhood came out. We had, it's not acceptable today because everybody don't want their precious baby to get hurt, but um, we had dirt clod fights. And that fort was consisted and made up of two by sixes, two by fours, four by fours, and a sheet metal roof. We had dug, it was halfway in the ground and halfway, it was a bunker, y'all. Come on now. <laughs> we dug an escape route that if the, they, 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 uh, uh, they didn't know about it, and then that if, if they started getting too heavy, we would crawl out through that little trench that we had covered up with boards and dirt and everything, and we would pop up on the other side. We were digging that hole, though. We had a lot of fun with that fort. We got to a point to where we couldn't break it with a pickaxe. We couldn't break it with... We had to get the rototiller out. One guy had the rototiller and four or five of us with shovels. And we dug that four, about four feet into the ground. It was hard work. We had years and years of fun out of that fort. I know you say, why are you talking about a kid? I learned that digging was hard work when I was a little kid. I didn't build it on Minecraft. <laughs> Look what I built on my Minecraft. I'm like, ooh, wow. You push the button. And that's the problem with our walk with God today. We're, we just want to build things by pushing buttons. Instead of putting the work in. I don't care how busy you are, what kind of job you have, what title you have. Come on, when you stand before God, God's going to say, that was more important than spending time with me. stand in this house. I went longer than I wanted to today. But God put this message in my heart to challenge us. How we lived for God five years ago, sis, ain't gonna cut it today. Ain't gonna cut it. 
We're going to have to put the work in. And I know that's why all of you are here this morning. You want your family saved. Right? You want your family saved. But you got to be willing to put the work in. You got to be willing to get a couple splinters. Well, I can't, I can't operate a shovel without a pair of gloves on. You're going to have to pull some splinters out. You're going to have to, there's some blisters going to come up on your hands. I read, I read a book, one of the most inspiring books that I've ever read besides the Word of God. Many of you have probably have read this. It was a book titled, Where the Red Fern Grows. Who's ever read that book? I've read it several times. That young man got some hunting dogs, trained his dogs, and his hunting dogs treat a raccoon. And it was the biggest tree in the forest around his house. And everybody said, just give up, get another raccoon. That young man, throughout the whole night, wrapped his hands with rags as the blood and the blisters. And he was so proud of his dogs, they said, no, this is the raccoon that I'm going to get for my dogs because this is what I trained them for. And he was so proud of that one, one, that one raccoon and and, 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 and it, the story went on and you know he won, won, won championships with his dogs and all that what I'm trying to say is there's going to be people in your life that tell you you don't have to put that time in look at the blisters on your hand look at the blood that's coming Look at, come on now you get your hands wrapped in rags and why, you, why are you digging this well Isaac said simply this if my daddy said we needed a well for his family I need a well for my family the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob in fact you go into the New Testament the woman that at the well this is our fathers dug this well for us I want to open up this altar for somebody here today that wants to take their prayer life to the, to the next level. I'm, we all have hobbies. I was telling, telling my family last night around the table down in L.A. County. Yeah. Last month, I've only been able to ride my motorcycle one time. Been busy. Is there somebody in this house that wants to take their prayer life to the next level? It's going to take some time. This altar is open. Y'all can already start coming up. Do you want your kids to be saved? Do you want your grandchildren to be saved? Come on, somebody. Your wife, your husband. It's going to take more of a, now I lay me down to sleep. I quoted the Lord's prayer. It's going to take more than that. You're going to have to desire it. You're going to have to want it. You're going to have to seek it. You're going to have to dig it out. And as my mother begins to sing this, this morning, I wonder today, are you willing to put the time in? Are you willing to put the work in? Sister Sheets, as you sing.